Hey there, I'm John Siskovich. Welcome to week four of raising chickens out on grass. Grass is what makes the magic in the chickens and mm, I'm happy to be doing it. So in this week's video, we're gonna cover our morning chores. We're gonna cover some of the maladies from raising the Cornish cross and get into some breeding and what we do with chicks if they're a little crazy. Uh, so stay tuned for that. I'm gonna answer a bunch of your questions on YouTube because you guys, honestly, we're building a community. We're doing this together. Uh, my goal in life is to get more people to try raising chickens Without further ado, let's get into Wednesday. It's Wednesday and we're into week four. I'm gonna take a look at this bird right here. So with straight run, we have males and females. They grow at different rates. So you'll have some smaller birds, some bigger birds. This one's one of the males. I just wanna see how feathered out it is. See, we got these primary flight feathers really coming in. They're actually two, two, three layers of them now. Have some tail feathers. Got some feathers along the leg there. Underneath, you'll see not a lot of feathers because it's warm outside. Uh, it's August. The spring birds and the fall birds, they feather out more. The summer birds, um, especially the Cornish cross, can remain a little bit naked, especially in the areas where, you know, they might trap heat. It's easier to vent themselves that way, control their body temperature. Chickens control their body temperature by panting uh, and by, you know, how many feathers they have and what and when they eat and drink and water. So. In the summer, for these birds that are growing really fast and have a high metabolism, they don't feather out as much. Um, but yeah, that's a three week, going into four week old male Cornish cross right there. Very exciting. Let's go on to tomorrow. So it's Thursday, pretty straightforward day. Move, feed, water, and that's it. You know, make sure their fence is up, make sure they're comfortable and happy, but not every day is a really big day on the chicken farm. So just morning chores and the birds are good. So I wanna take this opportunity to quickly answer a couple YouTube questions. The first one from Terry. How many birds per tractor? How many birds per chicken tractor? So the humane standard, as I understand it, is two square feet per bird. My chicken tractors are six feet by 10 feet, giving me 60 square feet, so I can fit 30 birds per tractor. I max out at 30, I never put more than 30. Um, if I have some mortality, or if anything goes awry, or whatever, and I have fewer birds, then I end up spreading out fewer birds per tractor, you know, 28, 29, 27, whatever the case may be. But 30 birds per, tra per tractor, two square feet per bird uh, has been my go-to rule of thumb. Uh, Sandra asks, the crates that I transported the birds from the brooder into the field in, and then when I transfer them from the field to the processor in, are they commercial or homemade? They're commercial. You can buy them online. Now, I shopped around and got a good price way back when. I haven't been able to match that price since. I got them for 45 bucks a piece because I bought 24 of them. Um, I know that Premier Supplies, uh, a company that I know and trust, sells them for $61, $62. If you go to farmmarketingsolutions.com forward slash Premier, or the button that pops up, uh, you can click on that link, search around for poultry crates, transport crates, uh, and you'll find them on there. What I like about the ones that they have there is not only do they have the door on top like I have, but what I don't have is a door at the very end. So when you're bringing the little birds out, you have that door that swings open on the end and you can kind of shoo all the birds out and you don't have to pick them up like I had to do. So that's pretty good. The link for that again is in the description for this video. You can click on that and follow through. That way they know you came from me. Um, yeah, if you have any questions, keep them coming in the comment section. I love answering your guys' questions. Let's go on to Friday. Maybe I'll get one or two more. So it's Friday, another pretty easy day. No big events, but I had some few minor events I wanted to talk about right now. Uh, so one of those minor events is the move. Move every single day. Uh, happened today. It happened yesterday. It'll happen tomorrow. Uh, and it goes along with what Jeff asked if he could see a before and after of the grass. So let's go through, and I'll show you directly the before and after on this batch, the production batch, and the homestead batch. So here's the first place that the full production batch started. You can see it's not all burnt down and crazy, but there is a nice even manure load over the pasture here. Uh, and that is the grass that has never seen chickens. So there's that, and then chickens started, and they go on there. So here's a before and after of the homestead grass. This is where the birds were for two days. And then the daily moves. See, as baby chicks, not a huge impact. Moving right up to the chicken tractor here. And that grass is gonna grow back green and lush. There's some impact and some poop. You know where they huddle in the corners, you can see it. But trust me from experience, that all grows back green and lush and wonderful and fantastic. So you saw 
you know, what birds, uh, what effect the birds are having right now. They're small, so they're not pooping as much, not eating as much. They're not, you know, sending stuff through their system. They're not scratching as much because they're just not as big. When they get bigger, the color of those blocks uh, gets a little bit more tan as they drop more manure, scratch things up a little bit more, eat some more of the grass. But it comes back even more lush when it recovers. And that's the benefit of those daily moves is that the grass recovers really well. Now popping up right there is Google Maps. From the outer space, you can see it. Uh, the effect, the green stripes through the pasture that these birds have had. That's really amazing. That's why I do this. If you feed the grass, you feed the ground, you're feeding the birds, you're feeding yourself, you feed the world, and everything is amazing. <laughs> so uh, on to the next question. So one of the, ev one of the events today uh, is going to be covered to answer Justin's question. Justin asked what I do with a dead bird. Uh, I had a bird that had, I talked about this in the past, I had uh, a weird leg thing and it just wasn't doing well. I may have been able to take it out and raise it in my house and hand feed it, but I it just it didn't doesn't pan out when you're a production farm. So what I did is I put the bird down really, really fast. It was suffering, so it's done now. What do I do with the birds? Well, the chicken tractors are very secure. I'm not worried about predators. So what I actually do is I throw the birds into the woods on the sides of my fields. That way it's kind of my sacrifice to nature, to coyotes, to whatever, um, that are going to come and then eat that bird or crows come down if the birds are small and pick them up and take them away. I've seen hawks actually come down and take the birds that I've thrown out into the field uh, or into the woods, take them away. I've tried burying or composting birds in the past and what has happened is that all we'll the coyotes come in and dig them out and then they're digging up my compost pile uh, and just pulling those birds out. So I just cut off the middleman and I throw them in the woods. Um, not always possible if you are doing this uh, on a home scale or you don't have that place to throw the birds. Uh, you can compost it, you can bury it, or you can throw it in the trash. Uh, if you actually kill the bird and it's big enough, you could process it and eat it if it's healthy. Um, so that's what I do with dead birds. I you know, sacrifice them to nature. Uh, they're picked up, they're taked away, taken away, and I hope that you know, helps maintain the balance with my four-legged neighbors and my winged neighbors. Um, but that's what happens to dead birds. That was one of the things that happened today. I had a bird die. It's never a good time when the birds die. Um, so I'm gonna end that topic and just head on to Saturday. So it's Saturday and I got a big event on farm today and I got the question on YouTube, why have a homestead batch and then why have the full production batch because I do this at scale as a profitable part of my farm. Well, I have the homestead batch because it's always in my backyard. Uh, I actually, whenever I have to keep birds back and let them grow a little bit longer, like if I have some slow growing birds, I keep them close to home. That way I can watch them, let them grow up a little bit and I'll either process them the next time around or I'll process them on farm for either our use or for a CSA member who's already prepaid for the bird. And why I do that is because not all of our pastures are accessible and we give farm tours every single weekend. And with those farm tours, I want people to see exactly why our chickens are different than other chickens. And having that homestead batch or a batch, we call them showcase chickens sometimes, uh, closer to home, part of that farm tour, showcases that not only this is you know accessible easy to do and it's great but like they can see the result of what it does to my lawn it's right as part of the farm tour they don't have to walk out to a back part of the pasture get ticks all over the legs it's crazy but uh yeah that's why i have a homestead batch it's saturday i have a big event today and the beautiful thing about pastured poultry is that i'll do my morning chores they'll be fed they'll be watered and then they're good to go i don't have to do anything for the rest of the day i can concentrate on the 100 plus people that are coming to the farm today and the 18 plus employees that i'll have under my <laughs> my guidance and uh, leadership today it's gonna be a crazy day let's check in on tomorrow to see how it went it's sunday it was an easy day for me today because i didn't have to do that much uh, Kate did morning chores. Kate and I run the farm. She's my wife and uh, she did all the chores today. I didn't have to do anything. I didn't even have to see these guys. I actually came out to the homestead batch because they were closer to my house and uh, I was sitting there with the beer like, oh, I got to shoot a video today. And um, yeah, Kate took care of the chores and she moved the birds along. Birds are doing great. And we had a big event yesterday. It went really, really well. 100 plus people on the farm, uh, about 18, 20 employees. Uh, or volunteer staff, and it was great. Uh, but, you know, worked myself to the max. 
Uh, a little bit stressed out, a little bit anxious, but it was our big event for the year, which went over really, really well. It was our Hop Harvest Festival. Now, you know, timeless in this YouTube video series. Uh, but the takeaway here is that someone else did chores for me. Uh, it was my co-farm manager, Kate, and uh, birds are doing great. And I just had to remember to shoot a video. That was it. It was easy, easy peasy. On to tomorrow. So we're getting close to the end of week four. It's Monday right now, and I had one more weird bird that I had my eye on and watched it, and it was just like only walking backwards. It was starting to turn blue. It was not doing really well. It was genetically like the legs were kind of messed up, and uh, I chose to put it down today. Instead of letting it suffer through life because chickens can be very brutal, they'll see a weaker chicken, and the other stronger chickens will just go and stand on top of it. It's kind of nuts. Part of that is the genetics of the Cornish cross, and I love the Freedom Rangers. I've raised them before, I'll raise them again. I'm, I'm gonna raise them next year and do some experiments and try to adjust my system to those specific breeds. Um, but with the Cornish cross, they grow very predictably, they go really fast, they look like what more like what you have in the grocery store, um, but they come with some bugs, and once in a while you get a bird that's kinda lame or destined to be lame. Now with being a chicken producer, you, it can be very easy. You just put them out in the fields, feed water, move them, you know, feed water environment. And those are the things you have to worry about. If you're doing this at scale, you know, I, I was in, um, at the homestead batch in, yesterday. Uh, if you're doing this at scale as a producer, if you want to grow your business, you have to scratch a little deeper. You have to dig a little deeper and see what exactly is going on with your flock, what is going on with your feed, and get all those details on the, the minutia, the little granular details that it takes to raise chickens. And for those details, um, there's a lot of great resources online, there's a lot of great resources in person when you talk to other farmers, and one of the best out there is APA, the American Pasture Poultry Producers Association. I'm a member of APA, I personally pay my dues for APA, I use their forum, and I get answers to my questions. If I have something funky going on, uh, I'll pose the question and I get great responses from other poultry producers from across the country. So not only me, this YouTube series and the resources I put out, but I highly recommend visiting app. I'll have a link in the description for this video. Uh, it's You can go to farmmarketingsolutions.com forward slash APA, A-P-P-P-A, uh, or APA.org and they have all the information and whatever you would want on there. It's really, really great. I recommend it. So let's head on over to Tuesday and wrap up this week of growing chickens out on grass. Other than that chick today, we've had you know, a few bumps in the road, but things are going really, really great on our homestead batch, on our production batch, and Tuesday. So it's Tuesday, it was a very straightforward day. I did the feed, the water, the move, lost my balance, and um, you know, nothing big to note. Uh, that's the great thing about chickens is that once they're set up, you just kind of do their little daily routine and then they're good to go. You got a few big days of doing stuff, but other than that, it's just kind of business as usual. During this time, it's important to take photographs, take video, tell your story. If you're doing this for a business or if you plan on doing this for a business in the future and you're just raising a homestead batch like this one chicken tractor, loon chicken tractor right here, it's good to take photos and video as you go because you know if you take a picture of a chicken close up, no one is going to be able to know whether you raise 2,000 or two. Uh, it's just that you have that picture of a chicken now and it's your picture, you own the rights to it, and you can use it for your marketing going forward. Most people have a smartphone these days. I'm recording this video on a smartphone. I use this re smartphone for recording all of my videos. Uh, so there's almost no excuse to not take photographs and video of your chicken tractors if you plan on going into business selling chickens. So without a lot to do today, I have a few more YouTube comments to address and some of them give tips for what will be coming in next week's video. Some really good stuff. And uh, let's get into Avid Avatar and Captain Quint asked about predators. They have all kinds of predators and they attack these chicken tractors. What do I do about it? So with the chicken tractors, they're built out of a nice solid frame. They have chicken wire and around the base of this one right here and on the sides, I added in the hardware cloth, the half inch hardware cloth where it's a tighter spacing. Now raccoons and stuff can reach their hands in and grab on the birds that might be on the edge, but with that hardware cloth, which I recommend in the new version of the book, um, they can't get their hands in, they can't get around it. They don't know what to do when they leave, they get frustrated. 
Now, contemporaneously, uh, which means right now, I have had a skunk on property trying to dig underneath the chicken tractors. And I've seen the dig marks around the outside of this chicken tractor. And I, you know, you go down and you smell a little bit, you see the paw prints, you do some identification, do some Googling, and um, you see that it's a skunk. And that skunk has not been able to get in here even though I'm not using electric. On the ones that I have out in the field where I have 240 birds, uh, I use an electric wire around the base and that has kept me safe from coyotes, fisher cat, bobcat, uh, all manner of things that I've had here on property. I've actually seen in person coyotes and bobcat. Uh, I've, a number of people here have seen a bear. Where I'm sitting right now, a black bear walks through occasionally, once in a while. He usually walks down the road, but sometimes he comes through this front yard. and. Uh, pretty crazy but so far knock on wood uh, the chicken tractors have held up to all manner of um, predators some of the variables that will go into whether or not you are successful with your chicken tractors and predators are how even your ground is if your ground looks like this then there's going to be spaces in something small like a skunk or a fox, which I've also seen a fox in person, it might be able to burrow underneath it. But if you have a nice level ground, uh, it's a lot of work for them to dig and get their bodies underneath there and they may or may not give up. So it depends on if you have dogs, if you want to use the electric wire, if you use the hardware cloth instead of just the one inch chicken tractor. But for me, I have pretty much every predator under the book. You start raising chickens and you realize that everything eats chicken uh, and nothing has broken in yet. So doing all right in that, that regard. Uh, as far as aerial predators, you can see it's all encased and hawks and stuff can't get in there. That's just a quick note on aerial predators. It's just like a non-issue. I'm never worried about it. Uh, the other one is from, and I'm gonna, sorry for this, Guillerme. Guillerme asks about pricing. How do I choose the pricing for my chickens when I sell them at market. I'm gonna go over that in a future video. It requires a little bit more depth. And as these videos tend to get a little bit long, I'm gonna save that. So subscribe to the channel if you're not subscribed right now. Follow along on the series, visit farmmarketingsolutions.com. I'll be posting all of that stuff as I can. Remember, I'm a professional farmer. I love what I do. I raise chickens at scale and my operation is profitable. Uh, I post this information on the internet because you guys are great. I want to see farming move forward. I want to see more people get into pastured poultry and uh, I'm doing my best, but it's still a very busy time of year. Um, other than that, let's head on to the video wrap up. So that's the end of week four. I had a lot of things to do on farm. Things went all right with my pasture broilers, both with the production batch and then the homestead batch at home. Things are good. So if you want your questions answered, whether on text or on video here, you can leave them in the comments section below for this video uh, or check out farmmarketingsolutions.com. Open to having discussion there, of course. And uh, check out the link psh, popping up. If you want all those videos in summary, you can go on to that check out weeks one through whatever depending on when you're watching if you're watching this live cool if you're watching this in the future welcome from the past any links or resources that were mentioned in this video are going to be in the description down below or on the web page for all of this uh, thanks for taking the time to watch the video appreciate you guys hanging out with me and until next time i will see you out in the field